Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Berg, co-dean of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Frank J. Battisti Memorial Lecture. Judge Battisti served on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio for 33 years, and he was chief judge for most of that time. Although he was a graduate of a well-known East Coast institution, Judge Battisti was a great friend of our law school. He hired quite a few of our graduates as his law clerks. Indeed, this lecture series came about largely because of the devotion of many of Judge Battisti's clerks who helped endow the series. We've had an extraordinary array of distinguished lecturers in this series, both from the law and from other fields in which Judge Battisti had an abiding interest. Previous lecturers have included prominent judges such as Leon Higginbotham, Nathaniel Jones, and Jack Weinstein. Distinguished legal scholars such as Lee Bollinger, Erwin Chemerinsky, and Michael Klarman. Prominent academics such as political philosopher John B. Elshkin, historian of education Diane Ravitch, and sociologist Douglas Massey. Religious figures such as Sister Helen Prigine and Bishop Nelson Perez and civil rights figures such as Julian Bond and Fred Gray. We've also had two of Judge Battisti's former clerks who went on to outstanding legal careers, retired Judge Marilyn Shea Stoneham of the US Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Ohio, and President Frank Wu of Queens College in the City University of New York, just to name a few. To introduce this year's extraordinary Battisti lecturer, I present my faculty colleague, Professor Jonathan Enton. Thank you, Dean Berg. Um, as Dean Berg mentioned, this lecture was made possible by the generosity of many of Judge Battisti's former clerks. I want to thank them, uh, and I regret that because we're in Zoom format, uh, we can't have them rise and be recognized, but uh, they should in indeed uh, be recognized uh, for making this lecture series possible. Today's speaker has a special connection to this series and adds great luster to that list of speakers Dean Berg mentioned. This year's Batisti lecturer is Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. She was very close to retired Judge Diane Karpinski of the Ohio Court of Appeals for the Eighth District, who was Judge Batisti's sister-in-law. Judge Karpinski was a very engaged member of the steering committee for this series, uh, but unfortunately, she passed away in December of 2020. We are deeply grateful that today's program will honor both Judge Battisti and Judge Karpinski. And if I might, let me ask that we observe a brief moment of silence in memory of Judge Karpinski. Okay. Um, Representative Marcy Kaptur represents Ohio's ninth congressional district. Now in her 20th term, she is the longest serving woman in the history of the United States Congress. A native of Toledo who lives in the house where she grew up, Congresswoman Kaptur received her BA in history from the University of Wisconsin and her master's degree in urban planning from the University of Michigan. She worked as a city and regional planner for 15 years, primarily in Toledo and Chicago, and served as a domestic policy advisor under President Carter. She began a PhD program in urban studies at MIT before being tapped to run for Congress, where she won an upset victory in 1982 and has been continuously reelected. Congresswoman Kaptur is a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, where she chairs the Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development, reflecting her long concern with the Great Lakes. She also serves on the Subcommittees on Defense and on Commerce, Justice, and Science. She previously served on the Committees on Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs, on the Budget, on Oversight and Government Reform, and on Veterans Affairs. She is the author of Women in Congress, a 20th Century Odyssey, published by Congressional Quarterly Press, 
Among her many awards are an honorary doctorate from the University of Toledo, the Distinguished Alumna Award of the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, and the Director's Award from Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. Representative Kaptur will speak this afternoon on Great Lakes Restoration, an era of hope and rebirth for our critical resource. It is my honor to present Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Enton. And I want to thank all of your distinguished guests, uh, your Dean Jessica Berg, and the leadership of your great university for your generous invitation to speak today. I'm honored to join your truly distinguished group uh, at your Batiste lecture, named for such a great man. Uh, from titans in the law, such as Fred Gray and Julian Bond, who've been mentioned, to constitutional and immigration specialists, I am grateful to address your esteemed gathering today. I consider myself fortunate to have met Judge Battisti uh, and members of his dear family, and I will speak about his spouse today. I'm also moved by the recent passing of my dear friend, Judge Diane Karpinski, whose high respect for the rule of law and civic activism changed Cleveland and our world for the better. A graduate professor of mine once observed, as America moves toward the 21st century, for the first time, our nation and world will confront limits. Somehow that seemed un-American. How will free people deal with limits? America's heritage, after all, was as a frontier nation with unlimited horizons heretofore, but finding itself, as time would ensue, in situations prior generations never faced. Yes, limits. Just yesterday, news reports indicate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere hit record highs. Indeed, the level is 50% higher than when the Industrial Revolution began in Britain about a century ago. The accumulation of CO2 is primarily caused by burning fossil fuels and deforestation and by a geometrically growing global population that, guess what, exhales CO2, and so do the animal populations required to feed us. Temperatures on Earth have been rising as human beings cumulatively test the natural world's limits. We are experiencing severe weather events as oceans warm and the climate changes. With more rainfall, the place we know best, the Great Lakes uh, and uh, its waters are at all time highs, a 124 year high. Here in Cleveland, formally called Forest City, we can ask some probing questions about how we can heal our place on spaceship Mother Earth. Astride the largest inland sea on the planet, the Great Lakes, let us ask how well are we tending our finite piece of the universe? I think a jury would say the biggest room in the world is room for improvement. Judge Battisti's legacy is legendary. He holds a unique role in helping the rebirth of our Great Lakes. During his tenure, our nation created and expanded the legal protections that serve as the cornerstone for the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1971, and the Federal Water Pollution Control Amendments of 1972. Today, these laws have been amended and updated to ensure that our clean water future is better protected and stewarded forward. Locally, the landscape for rebirth of our lakes catalyzed in 1969 when the Cuyahoga River caught fire. That astounding event captured the attention of a horrified nation ignorant to the environmental problems plaguing our land and waters. As an undergraduate student back then, I can remember visiting Washington, D.C., and first meeting then Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, the father of Earth Day, that passed a couple years later on April 22nd, 1970, over half a century ago. 
A decade and a half later, when I first was elected to Congress, something I had never even imagined when I was a student, I made sure to remind Senator Nelson of how very special that meeting was to me. In any case, in the midst of our nation's awakening conscience about the environment, Northeastern Ohio began to organize itself to prepare advanced wastewater treatment capabilities. A long simmering dispute with Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court Judge George J. McMonagle uh, between the city of Cleveland and its suburbs led to the creation of a regional sewer entity the forward-looking Northeast Ohio Sewer District still ably serving our region. The sewer management entity was envisioned to help our region develop a cleaner and brighter future for Lake Erie. Several years after the sewer district was created, Judge Batiste's wife, Gloria Karpinski Batiste, joined the Northeast Ohio Sewer District Board as a member from 1976 to 1983 and served an able role in guiding this fledgling organization to cement important progress. From the beginning, the sewer district was created out of legal necessity, as well as stricter federal rules and acknowledgement that clean water requires a sophisticated local response. Today, on the 51st, on the eve of the 51st Earth Day, our region, the sewer district, and the Great Lakes have come such a long way. While Gloria Karpinski Batiste was on its board, the Northeast Ohio Sewer District was growing to meet regional needs. The Sewer District implemented wastewater control programs that are making the Great Lakes swimmable again, drinkable, and is helping to ensure that our future is more secure. This history and Ms. Karpinski Batiste's critical role on Northeast Ohio Sewer District Board during these formative years served as a foundation for today's progress. We must create a future that protects our natural world for generations to come. We must help our region prepare to deal with challenging and changing climate, adapt advanced technologies, and invent our way forward to help our resource rich manufacturing and agricultural economy. Recently, I witnessed a fascinating thermal heat exchange invention installed at the Washington DC water sewer district that is literally turning a traditional sewage treatment facility into a renewable public energy utility. I saw the future and it was amazing. How exciting. Rather than being a huge energy consumer, the DC facility aims to become the dominant public energy producer and utility across the 3 million person capital region using sewage and water residue uh, and temperature differentials to produce power. I commend it to your attention. Our Great Lakes have made tremendous progress and reached numerous milestones that 51 years ago were only dreams. We need to do more. The Great Lakes Restoration Act the Clean Water Act and other pollution control acts have helped revitalize a vast watershed that binds the United States and Canada together. Since 2019, the United States Congress has localized our efforts to rebuild our region and supported a program called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We call it the GLRI. With over 5,877 projects across the Great Lakes Basin, We've invested $2.9 billion in federal resources right here at the place we call home. What started off with a vision of a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has resulted in a long-term restoration strategy that is yielding results, but we're far from finished. I wanna hold up a map of what some people consider to be the Great Lakes condition. I hope you can see that but you can see Lake Erie and Lake Ontario are quite sick. And you can look at some of the Northern lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, uh, for example, and they're a little less impinged, but we have our work cut out for us and time is not our friend. We need to move more quickly. The GLRI funds critical work that is used for restoration projects to control points of entry 
to the Great Lakes from devastating invasive species like Asian carp. Uh, we use the GLI for toxic sediment removal. We use the GLRI for preserving threatened coastal lands and species. There are so many milestones to acknowledge uh, for the GLRI success. But in 2020, we celebrated removing the 100th beneficial use impairment in the Great Lakes in our district as we celebrated this milestone on the Black River in Lorain County last year, a river that used to be known as the River of Tumors. Today, it is home for a reborn river and natural landscape where the fish can actually be eaten. The GLRI has also helped us delist major areas of concern on the Great Lakes. And we've been successful in remediating devastating environmental hazards across the Great Lakes, such as toxic chemicals. We're not finished with that job. As a result of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we've restored more than 440,000 acres of habitat, including over 60,500 acres of coastal wetlands, so important to filtering the water before it goes into the lake, and captured more than 274 million gallons of untreated urban runoff annually. We've captured over 1,500,000 pounds of phosphorus that was leaching into the Great Lakes, and we're far from finished with that job. That's one of the reasons that the lakes are so sick. GRI funds much of the work to mitigate harmful algal blooms, which disproportionately impact Lake Erie. And those blooms are fed by that nitrogen and phosphorus that leach into the lake. Recent, bloom, recent blooms span over 1,000 square miles, and they will continue to grow in size and intensify unless we manage them and empower farmers to control their phosphorus and nitrogen runoff. Historic rainfall makes this highly difficult, as more rainfall means more runoff. The western basin of Lake Erie is the largest watershed in the entire Great Lakes that empties into Lake Erie at its western point at Toledo. It extends over parts of three states and parts of Ontario, Canada, if one looks at the western basin as a whole. Currently, there is no legal instrumentality to manage environmental objectives to clean up the flow of nutrients from uh, this vast agricultural and urban watershed flowing into the tributaries and then into Lake Erie itself. All efforts thus far are voluntary, though well over $150 million of federal funds have been expended in attempting to stem nutrient runoff. To date, approximately 12% of the runoff has been properly managed. That is a start, but the lion's share of the challenge, 88%, lies ahead. With half of the land in the basin absentee owned, there is no accountability uh, that is attached to property owners. And with increasing rainfall, there is more nutrient runoff every year harming the lake. Congress approved the Great Lakes Restoration initiative of 2019 to extend the program and increase its funding levels, which we hope can reach a level of half a billion dollars, though that is far from enough. Uh, though more recent funding has totaled about $330 million or in that range. Keeping invasive species such as the Asian carp out of the lake, uh, Great Lakes is among our highest priorities. And in fact, because of two-way trade and just the passage of time, we have over 180 invasive species that are in the lakes today. The Asian carp is a new one that threatens us, and it is a major threat. It could totally eliminate our $7 billion Great Lakes recreational fishery and change the entire ecosystem of the Great Lakes. As chair of the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee, keeping this carp out of the Great Lakes remains one of my highest priorities. Early in his career, Judge Battisti was a legal advisor to the Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps is critical in envisioning uh, an environmentally sustainable future for our region. I view them as full partners in this effort. In the fiscal year of 2021 appropriations bill, which I wrote as chair of the Energy and Water Committee with a lot of help from colleagues, we provided directive language and sufficient funding for the federal portion of the Asian Carp Project. Finally, after years of work, we are able to get nearly $4 million 
were pre-engineering and design funding in the Army Corps work plan. And now Illinois and Michigan are working hand in glove to support the Brandon Road project. We are so pleased with that accomplishment. The fight continues and we're still years away from a completed project, but United Regional support will ensure this gets to the finish line. And until then, the US government uh, will be working hard to try to provide funding so that as this Asian carp moves up the Mississippi River toward Chicago, where it, it would, could enter our Great Lakes, that we fish out the carp that are coming from uh, that are coming north up the Mississippi River and now approximately 30 miles from the major Chicago shipping channel. I led uh, 27 members in requesting the Army Corps include funding in the Brandon Road project and will continue to do so as we move through the 2022 appropriation cycle. And I'm hoping the Biden administration will take a leadership role on this project. With federal funding starting, I hope it will move quickly and we also were able to increase the federal share of the project to 80% from the normal 65%. This makes it much more likely that Illinois, Michigan, and possibly other states can afford their local cost share. We really need a united regional effort to keep the Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. I will also point out this fiscal year, we made major progress on the Chicago Sanitary Sewer Canal dispersal barrier to keep the carp out. This project was stuck in limbo for years with the second barrier unnecessarily delayed. Our committee set aside the money for the Corps to complete the barrier to its designated capability. Let me add a word about the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and sustainability. The Corps needs more environmental engineers. As our nation's institutions evolve to face a changing world, the Army Corps of Engineers is evolving too. We are hoping that they will incorporate theories of resiliency and sustainability in their planning and engineering designs on both the civil as well as defense sides, and that they will wed civil engineering to environmental engineering more seamlessly. It is my hope that new legal advisors enter the core, and uh, as Judge Battisti did back in 1952 when he entered his service. I'm hopeful they will be given an increasingly complete mission statement that climate change is threatening our nation's built infrastructure and the ecological balance of our lakes and our world. The Army Corps is a crucial partner in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and has received funding for 898 GLRI projects worth $388 million. It is therefore my hope that in the years ahead, young legal advisors like Judge Battisti uh, will use their knowledge to upgrade our nation's built infrastructure to face our world's most pressing 21st century challenges related to climate change. Let me now turn to President Biden's budget just for a moment. Rather than playing defense with an unstable Trump administration that tried to gut the GLRI and never even appointed a Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Seaway Director, the Biden administration needs our help in building back better an agenda for the Great Lakes region. Let us think to the future and beyond the politics of defending individual programs like USGS, uh, the USDA's Natural Conservation Service programs, NOAA, uh, and so forth. Let us ask from a governance standpoint, what is the most effective economic development and environmental restoration governing structure that could propel faster progress across our Great Lakes? To that end, I've been thinking hard uh, as either part of the Build Back Better uh, initiative or separately advocating the establishment in the Great Lakes of an enhanced economic and environmental development mechanism to serve our Great Lakes as the Tennessee Valley Authority serves seven states south of us. I call my proposal the Great Lakes Authority. Northeastern Ohio, uh, just lost an opportunity, for example, to retool a shuttered plant to produce batteries near Lordstown. Where did the plant go? It chose Spring Hill, Tennessee, because of incentives that the Tennessee Valley Authority can offer that our region cannot match. In addition, our region continues to lose jobs from NASA at Brook Park uh, and other northeastern Ohio uh, contractors 
to Huntsville, Alabama for the same reason. We cannot compete with the power rates they offer. Also, if you look at the massive bonded indebtedness that communities across the Great Lakes region endure to meet EPA mandates, it precludes their ability to invest those dollars in other worthy projects in their own communities. I believe the federal government should assure more of the uh, environmental financing uh, by creating a new instrumentality where the federal government would shoulder more of that burden. Our region should build back better by imagining a Great Lakes authority, or we could think of a Bureau of Great Lakes Reclamation, or we could create a Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Development Authority with development power in its mission, or we might form a Great Lakes Regional Commission. We have to think together and think big about the next generation of investment across our region, which has so much to offer, but literally has been left behind as America's critical industrial and defense manufacturing sector. We should borrow the best experience from structures that other regions of our country already enjoy. For instance, we could supercharge a Great Lakes Regional Development Commission and give it a large lending capacity. We could empower it to make planning grants to regional development drivers in our states, and we could embed it with innovative tools for using resilience planning. Commissions like this could work in coordination with the states to target federal investments across the region. The Great Lakes can and must bring more tools to the Build Back Better development agenda. GLRI is built for environmental restoration, but it is not there to help the region collaborate on creating an integrated, modernized transportation grid. It is not there to prepare our ports and coastline in public infrastructure to address climate change. There is a nascent effort to study coastal resiliency and to help our states plan for changing water levels from increased rain events and the harmful algal blooms that threaten our water system. But a Great Lakes Authority could also house a green infrastructure bank with a regional focus. With a single entity that can operate across states and across the region, we can localize investments and hasten progress working together. One of the reasons I'm so pleased to address you today is to generate a broader conversation about Great Lakes development in this modern era. Let's circle back to Judge Batista's legacy and understanding that everyone needs clean and safe drinking water. It was 50 years ago that Judge Batista became chief judge, the year of the Cuyahoga River burning. That was the year the modern environmental movement started when Congress created the Clean Water Act. The federal government provided federal support for projects through the state revolving fund and the traditional federal share for Clean Water Act projects originally was 75%, but was reduced to 55% in 1981. So for 50 years, the federal government shoved off this responsibility to the impacted and often poor communities across the Great Lakes. Local obligations have snowballed. Nationally on the clean water side, the water infrastructure backlog has grown to two hundred and seventy billion dollars in Ohio alone. We have demonstrated a 14 billion dollar plus wastewater infrastructure need and in our district alone nearly a billion dollars 962 million of an unpaid bill. In Cuyahoga County alone EPA data indicates a 2.9 billion dollar unmet construction need. So I'm proud of the progress we've made on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the milestones we are meeting, but there are big bills coming due and the federal government, in my opinion, using its vast power should help relieve some of the stress on the communities across the Great Lakes. As we build back better, our region must speak out loudly with unified voices and advocate for something more of regional consequence. For the same reason that Cleveland created the Northeast Ohio Sewer District, we must also acknowledge and address the enormity of these wastewater investments to help our region maintain and increase our progress. As our nation rec reconciles the enormity 
of the racial divide, we must acknowledge that by placing greater economic burdens on communities that cannot afford the infrastructure bills, communities of color, and communities that have been left behind, the federal government is perpetuating a social divide that prevents these communities from taking hold of their future. Economic development is a distant reality for communities that cannot even pay their water bills. I am reminded of how in Detroit, the pandemic was made worse by thousands of individuals in the heart of that city not being able to have water. They could not pay their bills. Therefore, is my hope that as a society and as a region, we will measure up to the call of a new era and provide bold national investments in the Great Lakes region to help our communities meet these obligations to build a cleaner and brighter future. In closing, I wanted to just read one paragraph uh, that uh, is written by a, by a wonderful uh, author, uh, the Dan Egan, this was published in 2017, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. For those who love the Great Lakes as I do, this is a must read. And he says uh, here that in looking at the Great Lakes, there is a different way to grasp the scale of the Great Lakes. Roughly 97% of the globe's water is salt water. Of the 3% or so that is fresh water, most is locked up in the polar ice caps or trapped so far underground it is inaccessible. And of the sliver left over that exists as fresh surface water readily available for human use, about 20% of that, one out of every five gallons available on the planet can be found in the Great Lakes. That is not an insignificant fact at a time when more than three quarters of a billion people don't have regular access to safe drinking water, including some in our own country. Thank you to everyone here today. You are critical partners in this fight to protect our lakes and in honoring the legacy of Judge Batista and understanding how vital the Great Lakes region is, not just to the United States and Canada, but to the entire world. Thank you so very much. I look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you, Congresswoman Kaptur, for a very wide ranging and thoughtful lecture. Um, couple of housekeeping details. If you have questions, and I apologize for not having uh, said this earlier. If you have questions, please type them into the Q and A uh, uh, balloon at the bottom of your screen and we will get them uh, to, uh, to the Congresswoman for her response. Um, second, um, we're delighted to have you. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a CLE uh, credit bearing program, but I think that that in terms of substance, that is a minor detail. Um, while we're waiting for questions, let me take the, the moderator's prerogative of opening the, this. Um, Congresswoman, I wanna pick up on two points that you made in your talk. Um, one was that many of these environmental issues and Great Lakes issues are time sensitive. The second is that we need to be concerned about having sound governance. When the Clean Water Act was passed, when the EPA was created, those, those things happened under Republican presidents and were supported by Democrats. Uh, and over, over time, we have seen that the center of gravity in the political parties on environmental issues seem to have diverged. Uh, that suggests that we will see perhaps different environmental policies under democratic administrations than under Republican administrations. What implications does that have for our ability to deal with some of the problems that you addressed in your lecture? It's a very good question, Doctor. Um, I think it has become more difficult in some respects. Thus far, we in the Great Lakes region uh, have managed to maintain a bipartisan coalition, for example, on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, on the Great Lakes Task Force, on our US-Canadian relations. I hesitate to mention names, but um, 
obviously Congressman David Joyce of Ohio and Congressman Bill Huizinga both from Michigan, both are Republicans. Uh, uh, Congressman Fred Upton of Michigan. Uh, there are Republicans who live on the lake who understand what they are, uh, whose way of life and the communities that they live in depend on the Great Lakes and a healthy Great Lakes. So we still have very strong regional support um, to date. Uh, there are others in Southern Ohio who do not support our Great Lakes efforts. Uh, what makes our area unique is that if you look at the Great Lakes watershed map, you will find that most of Ohio, for example, is not in that watershed. A lot of people don't know geography anymore, <laughs> but if I hold up this map um, and you look at this book, you will see that only the communities that are in the northern part of Ohio actually drain into the Great Lakes. Uh, the state legislature in Ohio, uh, I won't even tell you some of the experiences that I've had, with people who've not been to the lake or don't realize we're in a different watershed and that our challenges are different than maybe the Columbus region might face. So I think the proximity to the lakes by a number of individuals in the other party um, uh, do give us some hope for this region. Nationally, uh, we run into all kinds of challenges in states like Texas and uh, the passage of important laws, even dealing with climate change, for example, we're into this ideological debate right now, which is rather dangerous in terms of what we face because it wastes a lot of time uh, when we could have our shoulder to the wheel. Uh, but, but we need leaders in both parties. And uh, many of the farmers uh, in our country uh, who uh, uh, tend to be uh, uh, in some regions voting Republican, they understand, those who are true stewards of the land understand the seriousness of the challenge and they will be voices in ways that perhaps before they have not. So I'm, I'm still hopeful, but it has become a bit more difficult and contentious. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some questions uh, now. Let me just turn to the first. Um, many thanks for an excellent presentation. What can the average person do to advance the agenda of preserving the Great Lakes? All right, well, first of all, uh, read the book, <laughs> um, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. I'm sure you all, many of you already have, but uh, you can join organizations that fight uh, for the Great Lakes. Uh, you can contact your member of Congress, uh, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, for example. I don't wanna just pick one organization. Uh, there are uh, clean water organizations uh, that um, uh, advocate. There's an Ohio Environmental Council. There are different groups you can join. Uh, so you're, you enhance your own power by joining with others. Uh, you can um, put social media uh, out about uh, issues that you see are important uh, to, to the Great Lakes. Uh, for Cleveland, Greater Cleveland, remember I said Forest City. Cleveland used to be known as Forest City. One thing every citizen can do is plant trees and bushes and shrubs that are native to our region. We in Michigan and Ohio now need to plant 20 million trees to replace what was lost with the emerald ash borer and other um, diseases that have struck some of our trees. Uh, we need to produce more oxygen. Uh, getting young people to understand why trees are important, uh, reading to them, reading in grade schools, reading in the schools, teaching about what an individual can do. Uh, urban agriculture is taking off uh, organizations like Ohio City in the Cleveland area, for example, uh, or uh, the uh, gardening projects that uh, communities take on, uh, produce more oxygen, you bring food production closer to home. These are all lost arts in some places and we need to restore them because we need the trees to produce oxygen and to absorb the CO2 and we're short. And one of the, one of the um, uh, outcomes of that is in places like Cleveland and all the urban areas I represent, Lorraine, Toledo, uh, the asthma rates are going up because there's not enough oxygen uh, and to filter the air. And uh, people, it isn't just the job of the federal government to plant trees. Uh, local people can make a big difference. 
Uh, in addition to that, recycling is very important, as you know, um, making sure that the soils are um, rich with nutrients. And we have some phenomenal farmers. I was just a part of a meeting in um, uh, Milan, Ohio, uh, hosted by Chef's Garden, one of our remarkable agricultural companies. And uh, we had farmers from all across Ohio. And you know what they were worried about? They were worried about soils that lack nutrients. They held up celery grown in non-nutritious soil and celery grown in nutritious soil. And one of the horizons for soil science now is how do we restore real nutrition to the soils? And why would we want to do that for healthier living? And the farmers are becoming, the wise farmers are becoming concerned that we've substituted commercial fertilizers for natural um, uh, soil action. And we are paying a big price for that in terms of human health and the future of agriculture in our state and elsewhere. So there are leaders in become associated with groups like that. One of my favorite groups is Future Farmers uh, of America and uh, um, 4-H, organizations like that that help young people reunite with the earth rather than just with a uh, iPhone or a, a smartphone to actually get back into nature and understand our connection to nature. Uh, so th those are some thoughts. Thanks. Um, we have another question. Um, as you described, the Brandon Road project and the electric barriers you referenced are critical and time sensitive initiatives to keep the Asian carp out of the Great Lakes in the short run. But in the longer run, will those be sufficient or is severing the Chicago Ship Channel as a connector between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes watershed the only reliable long-term solution to this profound risk? Well, you know, we <laughs> that's the million dollar question. We are, we are working hard to prevent those carp from getting into the lakes, but it is a breathtaking problem. And politically right now, we can't win. Illinois has such power um, and the movement of goods from Minnesota down to the Mississippi through Chicago, the Chicago financial interests in the state of Illinois, uh, moving goods down the Mississippi is such a powerful uh, coalition. We found it almost impossible initially to even get support of the governor of Illinois for our effort to create the Brandon Road project and financing because the states have to put some money into this. Luckily, Governor Pritzker of Illinois, th write Governor Pritzker thank you letters, write him thank you letters. Uh, the uh, same is true with uh, the governor of Michigan. Uh, Michigan has now uh, joined the coalition supporting our efforts. And thank uh, Governor DeWine in Ohio because we need the support of these governors to create a barrier. Uh, unless we can figure out how to make the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation more effective in moving those goods rather than to the port of New Orleans uh, through the Great Lakes by some Canadian US uh, multimodal connect, I think it's almost impossible to close off that shipping channel. Uh, even though from, a, uh, stand, from the standpoint of uh, engineering, it makes sense. Uh, but let me tell you, these Asian carp are tricky. Some of our my colleagues from Tennessee, the Asian carp have now gotten into the streams in Tennessee, and they never supported our efforts. Oh, that's a Great Lakes problem, you know, worry about it up there. Well, now the Asian carp have gotten <clears throat> into Tennessee, and Republicans and Democrats uh, from that state are now very worried about what it means. Well, it's too late because it's already there. Hopefully we can find a genetic control. Hopefully down the road, uh, science will lead us there. But right now we're working on engineering structures and we are fishing out. We're doing fishathons down the Mississippi River, which the federal government is paying for to keep those fish out of the Great Lakes. It's a very, very tender process and one fraught with, um, with difficulties, uh, but we're doing all we can uh, with that electronic barrier right now and uh, trying to keep them away 
from that channel, but it, it is a very daunting problem. Let me raise, let me encourage other questions, but while we're waiting, let Congresswoman, maybe I can raise one more. Um, the Great Lakes obviously border on, on um, a number of US states, and you've talked a lot about state and federal efforts, but the Great Lakes also border on Canada. Um, how do your efforts and other domestic US efforts uh, to protect and, and improve the Great Lakes, how do they relate to Canadian policies? Well, uh, we, our faiths are bound. And we have uh, many uh, parliamentary exchanges with our Canadian brethren. Uh, for instance, uh, probably one of the most active um, endeavors that we have had since the 1950s uh, is the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, where our ports meet on a regular basis, where there is exchange of uh, concerns related uh, to the Great Lakes. I'm hoping that if we create this Great Lakes Authority on the U.S. side, that we will be able to link even to some provincial development projects where they can uh, find development instrumentalities in Canada to help us enhance our part of North America. Uh, so if we look at the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway uh, corridor as an example of what we were able to accomplish together, we can do the same with additional transportation uh, projects. Uh, Cleveland has tried to embark upon ferry service between Cleveland and Canada. Maybe that's not the, I'm not saying I'm against that, I would support that, but maybe there are other modes uh, of transportation, very forward looking, that can be uh, developed uh, between our country and our Canadian brethren. Um, uh, in the area of energy, I think there is great opportunity for power sharing uh, as we look at the future of energy across our region. They produce a lot more energy from hydropower than we do. Uh, maybe we have something to learn from them in that regard. Uh, but as we look toward um, an all of the above energy policy, uh, the United States is really very poor in terms of using, uh, of inventing new power systems that are based in hydro. I think we could do a lot better there. And I think we have a lot to learn from the Canadians. Uh, they are our major trading partner. Um, the new bridge is being built in Detroit. Uh, that's a land bridge to uh, Canada uh, to try to move some of these trailer rigs uh, more quickly. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity for much greater cooperation if we could master the geography. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Let me just pick up on, on your last observation. One, we have had for many years a very active Canada-United States Law Institute that has done annual conferences on a wide range of issues. Uh, and I, am, I know that, that uh, environmental issues have been part of their subject. Uh, I will make sure that our Canada US Law Institute knows about your engagement and perhaps they can follow up with you uh, for, for some of their future programs. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And you know, I just wanted to point out to everyone who will hear this, we live in a unique time with uh, President Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris, the administration, Biden-Harris administration. Never have I seen a president appoint a Secretary of Energy from the state of Michigan, a Secretary of Housing and Urban Development from Ohio, and a Secretary of Transportation from Indiana. All Midwesterners all know where the lakes are. This moment mm -hmm. will never happen again. This has never happened in my entire career. If we can't figure out how to work with those three cabinet secretaries and create something of lasting value. Judge Battisti would understand this opportunity. You understand this opportunity. We need to use it. It will not happen again. Not, I would say maybe once in a hundred years, <laughs> uh, if that. So this is really our moment. The Great Lakes have got to measure up. 
that's a wonderful way to conclude a really informative and inspiring program. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're delighted to have had you. And as I said at the beginning, I was I predicted that you would bring honor to the lecture series and to Judge Batisti and Judge Karpinski, and you've certainly done that. So thank you so very much. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again for future programs. Thank you very much, Professor Anton. I want to thank Matthew Kaplan on our Washington staff and Susan Rowe in our district staff uh, uh, in Ohio for doing such a fine job to prepare us for this. Okay, before we go, um, there, there is one more question that just came in while I was wrapping up. So if you don't mind, let me ask that one. Um, Referring back to the Biden administration's infrastructure proposal, what do you think can and should be done to try to elicit bipartisan support to get it enacted? We are all working on that. On the, every member, and I have my committee responsibility, every chair uh, in uh, the House um, is trying very hard to work with their uh, counterparts in the other party. I'm hoping this can happen. I know the president wants this very much. That's the kind of individual he is. I can't predict what will happen, um, uh, but I'm hoping that this can be a bipartisan proposal in the end. All, all I can control is my committee. I can try to do my job there. Thus far, we have been very fortunate. And uh, I think the real challenge may come in the Senate uh, where the margin is so thin um, the margin is somewhat thin in the House too, but there's still more camaraderie in the House. Um, I hope that I hope that um, the relations between the uh, Republican and Democratic leaders in the Senate will allow for uh, dialogue and and a meeting of the minds. But we can't hold the country up um, because of partisan gridlock. And I think you know the Senate will make its own decisions. Uh, and I think we're operating on two tracks right now. One track is cooperation. And I think the Senate is operating on the track of, if that doesn't happen, then we will move forward with some type of reconciliation bill. Well, on that sobering note, um, let me just make sure that we don't have any other questions here. And it doesn't look like we do. So let me, let me now bring the proceedings to a formal close. Thank you again so much. And thank you to our audience. And as someone who worked with your staff, let me say for the record, it was a pleasure working with your staff to make this program possible. So thanks to thank them. You. And of course, thanks especially to you. Thank you very much, doctor. Good luck. Have a good spring. Everyone plant trees. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care, folks. <laughs>